Everybody here knows that we like to celebrate the people, places, and food behind the stories. And today I want to introduce you to Sylvie Bigar. She has written a book called Cassoulet Confessions, and I just couldn't wait to share it with you because it's a memoir. It's about food and family and France, and it just had so much wrapped up in one book that I thought it was just right in line with what we like to share with everyone. So Sylvie, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for reading the book. I'm yes, glad. I loved every word. And I mean, oh. that. Um, you're an award winning writer. You've written travel pieces and food pieces for all sorts of very well known magazines. Um, I am from East Texas. I don't know if you can see my map up here, but there's this teeny weeny little green spot in the corner, which is Northeast Texas. We can barely pronounce the word cassoulet, much less try to make it. <laughs> so um, you wrote in your book that um, cassoulet, or one of the chefs told you that cassoulet has kind of almost fostered its own religion. Just talk to me about how you got involved with cassoulet to begin with and how that story became so much more. So in fact, I, I, want, I want to disagree with you. I think that um, everybody can make cassoulet. I feel like I'm in Ratatouille, you know, everybody can cook, right? Yeah. Um, so what is cassoulet? Maybe it's good that we just, you know, describe the dish a little bit for- That's great. For people who might not be familiar with it. And so basically cassoulet is a stew. It's an uncomplicated rustic stew the base of it uh, beans uh, and it doesn't have to be a particular beans you have plenty of beans in texas uh, wonderful beans um, and there are many recipes for cassoulet but there are you know three basic uh, sort of master recipes just like there are you know a few master recipes for french sauces so usually it's duck confit, which is duck um, cooked in its own fat, pork, uh, sometimes lamb, and beans, and herbs, and a lot of garlic, and pig skin um, as well. I mean, this is not a light dish, but everybody can cook cassoulet. Uh, in my book, I have a recipe that takes three days, and then I have what I've called gateway cassoulet. Um, and, uh, and actually the gateway cassoulet is in the September issue of Food and Wine. Um, and uh, it, it's, a, it's a recipe that is easy and that you can start in the morning and then you'll have your cassoulet by the end of, uh, of the day. Lovely description and it makes it seem almost doable. And you can see, I've, I've read the book, I've marked all my little tabs because words can be really beautiful. They can, you know, paint pictures, they can write songs. So it was a really great reminder that there is, there is a better side of, um, of writing. And sometimes I think that all that's needed really is to uh, let the magic happen, uh, because the truth is, um, I went to the southwest of France on an assignment, uh, a simple because I was working as a food and travel writer, and I was assigned a story on the history of cassoulet. Now, you may know that um, there are a few of these iconic French dishes. There's choucroute in the north, there's bouillabaisse. Uh, in the south, which is kind of this um, fish stew, fish and shellfish stew. And then, of course, we all know, you know, Julia Child's Boeuf Bourguignon, right? These kind of iconic dishes. And cassoulet is one of those. So I thought I'd just go there. Um, I'm actually originally from uh, Switzerland, Geneva. French is my first language. So I just, you know, would go there and, and report on my story come home, uh, write the piece, get my check and move on. In fact, what happened is that this one 
week trip back in 2008 changed my life. Why? Because I encountered um, really magic. And so how do we help people do the same thing? So we love publishing cookbooks. We Whether it's an individual with a family history of some special recipes that they want to capture in a book, or it's a chef or a food business that really want to share their experiences and showcase their recipes, we always encourage them to share stories you know, not just share your recipes or photos, but really dig deeper and share the stories behind the food. What tips can we give people when it's time to start writing and sharing the stories behind the food? I think we all start in the kitchen and I think we all start with the family. It's not always rosy. It's not always good memories, but I think that a lot of our um, taste memories happen, um, you know, get sort of imprinted uh, at, as children. Um, and sometimes it's painful to go back there. And sometimes people have forgotten uh, what happened, you know, were they scolded because they tasted grandma's, you know, chocolate mousse or um, what happened. But in fact, it's it's really what we are fascinated by. I think we can all say that. We all love recipes, but we love stories, right? We love human stories. We love love stories. Um, we love drama. Uh, we love poetry. And all of, of these genres basically start, I think, in childhood. Yeah, if you look back at, so even even as a marketing guide, you know, we rely a lot on stories and we always say when when there's conflict, the story gets interesting. And I think that's the point, too, I want to make for people is that don't hold back from sharing, you know, the hard things, the the things that might be a little bit painful, because that's when you really show that human connection and and something that we all have in common. Exactly. And actually, um, while I was writing um, Castle Confessions, um, I found plenty of conflict. Uh, that being France, you know, um, chefs and cooks have very definite ideas of how things should taste, how things should be cooked or not. Um, and in my book, I mean, we go to the extreme because there's also the whole story of what kind of pot is the right clay pot, right, to cook the cassoulet. Um, and, uh, and people actually almost fight you know, <laughs> physically about things like that. Um, and, and there are several different shapes of, of clay pots. And actually, um, I've been working with a company in Minnesota called Clay Coyote, um, and they've created the perfect cassol, because that's the name of the dish, to go with the book. Ah, perfect. I can't wait to look it up. <laughs> well, talking about culture, let's dig in there for just a second, because we've got, um, you know, things that that happen in our childhood that were you know, we're really connected to, and then you've got the, the f sort of the French take on many things versus what we may experience here in the U.S. So I've got a couple of things in mind. Let's talk about one thing. Um, when in the book, you were talking about sort of Christmas versus Hanukkah and your experience as a child and kind of wanting to be part of Christmas, but then really loving and appreciating your own culture, the the traditions. And I think for for many of us, we don't necessarily have a history of these rich traditions in the same way that you might have had um, in the Jewish faith. So if you don't mind, I'm going to read just a short paragraph. Um, you say at school, I hated feeling different, but I enjoyed the traditions we followed at home. One gift for each of the eight nights of Hanukkah, the winter festival of lights. 
the pure pleasure of wedging my tongue through the salted butter and thick honey I lay on a matzah cracker, the unleavened bread eaten at Paso Passover, um, heading to the synagogue to hear the deep baritone of the young rabbi on Friday nights. That's what I wish we shared more, I think, is the that feeling that we each experienced and took time to appreciate in each other. So while I don't think I have similar experiences, that one paragraph connects me to you and to the Jewish faith in some small way. And I love having that bit of insight and understanding. Well, I, I mean, thank you so much for saying that. Um, it, it's interesting because it seemed as though when I when I started writing that, you know, so many of my experiences would be sort of different and people wouldn't be able to relate. And in fact, what I'm what I'm realizing um, is that we all have these universal feelings, right? So I had a matzo with honey, but you had your Christmas cookies. I'm assuming you're Christian. Sure. Um, and then which recipes did your, you know, was it your grandmother? I mean, that's kind of a cliche, obviously, but you know, it's, you, you have the Thanksgiving turkey, right? Thanksgiving is not celebrated in, in Europe. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you know, the first time I tasted a sweet potato casserole, you know, when everybody at the table is just saying, mm, and they're all, you know, <laughs> in heaven, and I'm, and I'm thinking, mm, this is strange, this is sweet, but it's a vegetable, you know? One of the quotes in the dessert cookbook that I did um, is about sweet potato pie. And it's the, he said, only a Southern, true Southern woman would turn a vegetable, you know, a sweet potato into a pie. And, <laughs> but it is one of my favorites and I don't care for sweet potatoes, but I love my mother's pie. So that was, yeah, that's a good memory too. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Talk about the um, sort of the French culture a little bit, because I think in the U.S. we have this stereotype of the French culture and, and you're describing how they could even come to blows over the proper way to make certain things. So how accurate is the stereotype of the French chef and of what did you discover that was a little different than what you expected? So. I'm not really sure which stereotype you're referring to, <laughs> but I'm assuming that, um, you know, based on what I've seen here and I've done work with, uh, you know, the chef Daniel Boulou, um, actually I wrote his latest cookbook, uh, Daniel, My French Cuisine. And so I've spent a lot of time in his kitchen of, of his uh, you know, flagship in New York City, flagship restaurant, Daniel. Um, and I've seen the chef, the French chef in action. Um, so I think the stereotype, and please tell me if you think I'm wrong, um, is, is maybe the image of the chef who is bossy um, and maybe uh, knows exactly what he wants and it can only be one way. And uh, I think Americans sometimes get a little self-conscious about not um, eating the right way or not you knowing you know which utensils to use because there's three different forks next to the plate things like that i was not interested in any of this in cassoulet confessions i'm interested in traditions ingredients authenticity i mean the epitome of slow food really the stew you know and the only thing that matters is how does it taste? Do you like it? Do you love it? You love it. I love it. That's it. Universal, you know, feelings. That's really all I was looking for. And I think the other thing I took away from it was not only these excellent ingredients, you know, beautifully prepared, but slowing down, like you say, it's, it's slower in the kitchen and the way it's prepared, but it's also slowing down at the table to appreciate that time together and the flavors there, because I think Americans tend to just, you know, move on to the next thing. 
whereas it really whether it's cassoulet or um, another beautifully prepared meal it becomes an experience and I think taking the time to enjoy that experience is is a really good takeaway I think so and and I think Julia Child already spoke about that all these years ago the importance of of taking the time to enjoy and I think we saw this even in in the movie Julia and Julia right yep we did and it's a good reminder so talking about you so other than cassoulet what dishes are you known for um I make a good lamb shank actually um and I love honestly the recipes of Mark Bittman um because they are very simple they never fail and so you can use them as a base you know there's a there's a New York Times uh, lamb shank recipe where I think he has four ingredients salt pepper olive oil and lamb shank right and and I love that because in a way I look at that as a blank canvas um and then you can add things you know something that I love to add for example with with lamb is um uh, orange zest you know within that casserole but it seems as though i always go back to slow cooking yeah i i can see why yeah. <laughs> uh let's see what else tell me uh, again other than cassoulet what is your most memorable meal most memorable meal um at home was the uh tarragon roasted chicken that uh we made often and that i always requested on my birthday ah. and, and it's the perfect roasted chicken and i think that people um you know have maybe a bad it i think roasted chicken has a bad rep um in the states I think it's often considered as you know maybe it's you, you get a piece of chicken meat and three in the in the south you know something like that um and but the way uh you know this again i hate to say this but the slow way that you can roast a chicken with herbs you know tarragon uh particularly is a, is a really good good combination that's uh, something i love Sounds delicious. And once again, I am instantly hungry. <laughs> Actually, that is my utter, you know, goal in life is that people will say maybe at some point, you made me hungry. <laughs> well, I think you did that many times in your book. <laughs> so Thank for you. those of us who want to crawl out there and give it a try, we're going to try making cassoulet. You said you've got um, a simple just a simple version in here that we can start with yes <clears throat> so i would say uh start with what i called the gateway cassoulet it's on page 152 okay um and the prep time is about 40 minutes and the cooking time is only two and a half hours nice so do this you know take a sunday and and do this get your ingredients in advance um and i think that the goal is that at the end of the meal you're going to want to go back and take the longer recipe nice and, and you're going to want to see the difference between the two i am definitely going to try it and i will keep you posted <laughs> please do is there anything else that you just wish people knew? And that's a big blanket statement. It can be about food, about France, about um, New York, about, you know. Well, I'm going to I'm going to tell you, since you are in the business of helping people write their their books, um, I, I'm going to tell you that um, I think we all have stories to tell. And I think we know what these stories are. It has not been an easy road. It took me about 10 years to write 154 pages, which is kind of a joke. Um, and so what I want to say is 
don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. Uh, keep going. Don't get discouraged by the letters of rejections. We had a lot of letters of rejections. Um, but at the end of the day, you have a story to tell. And there's probably a lot of us who want to read that story. Mm. Thank you for that. That's such good advice as we wrap up. So where can people find your book? Everywhere. <laughs> um, everywhere in the independent bookstores that we all love uh, around the country. But then, of course, on, you know, barnesandnoble.com and Amazon. Right. And uh, IndieBound and where all the good books are sold. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, so I will be sure and post a link you know, in the comments, whenever we get the video posted, and I'll be sure people know how to find the book. Thank you again for being with us today. This has been great. And I just wish you so many more food journeys to come. Thank you so much, Elaine. Thanks for having me on.